Good afternoon. Um, my name is Alex Torrens and I'm a senior curator here at the art section. Is it on? Hello? Is that better? No? I'll try again. Testing? No? I can see Dave in the back there. Should be good now? Okay. So anyway, thank you again for coming along today. I'd like to start um, this afternoon by acknowledging the original custodians of the land that the memorial stands on, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. It's my pleasure to introduce author Anne-Louise Willoughby, whose biography of prominent Australian artist Nora Heysen was released in April this year. Heysen is arguably one of Australia's most significant female artists of the 20th century. She was the first woman to win the coveted Archibald Prize for Portraiture in 1938 and Australia's first official female of war artist. Appointed in 1943, she served until May 1945, and in, which has included seven months in New Guinea. And over the course of that commission, um, completed more than 170 artworks for the Australian War Memorial. Anne Louise Willoughby is a journalist and freelance writer with a background in Italian and fine art history. The Nora Heysen biography has been written as a substantial component of her PhD in creative nonfiction, um, which she is currently in the final months of, um, completing at the University of Western Australia. Anne Louise was granted unrestricted access to family archives when writing this book and is the only author to have had the permission by the family to write about Nora's life and work. So can you please join me in welcoming Anne-Louise to the stage. Thank you very much. And it's really, really lovely to be here, um, working in the archive at the memorial with the assistance of Alex and the team has been an honour apart from anything else. Um, I'm so pleased to be here to talk about Nora. In 1943, after despairing for months repeatedly watching shiploads of young men sail out of Sydney Harbour, Nora Hyson was clear that she wanted to make a serious contribution to the war effort. She had tried to volunteer at the Navy canteen, but she was sacked for putting too much filling in the sandwiches. But she took umbrage at that because she felt that these men deserved the very best and plenty of it. So she looked to where her natural talent could be applied. While Nora never sought recognition for herself, uh, me speaking to you today means that through her commission, she succeeded in her work as an official war artist in keeping the memory alive of those she drew or painted. Though she abhorred war, like us all, she applied to become a war artist with the intent to record the sacrifice so many made for their country and to record the incredible work done by the women's services and the enlisted men that they worked alongside. Her father, the renowned Australian landscape painter Hans, painter Hans Heysen, was a pacifist and he didn't want his daughter to go to war. He said that she would see things she would never forget. The realities of war, uh, World War I were still so present for many affected by the war to end all wars and this was true. Nora did see things she would never forget. And today her work as this country's first female official war artist stands as a memorial to what many endured, to the ingenuity of Australians in the Pacific arena, to the camaraderie of the men and women in the services, and to those who gave their lives. <clears throat> Aside from her patriotism, Nora was an artist looking for subject matter. Art historian Catherine Speck writes, inspired by the photographic work of Damien Parra and George Silk, which was reproduced in the Daily Press, she decided, I might as well use what I can do in some capacity. Nora said in an interview, there were wonderful photographs of bringing down the wounded and the blinded men being led and the comradeship amongst the men. And I thought there would be good subject matter there that I'd be interested in. I was a good draftsman. I could draw and that would be a contribution. For artists, the economic constraints that came with war meant that there was little money circulating for art. The nation was focused on the war effort and the livelihood for artists that had been available post the depression years was once again diminishing. 
From a purely practical point of view, a War Artist Commission would allow Nora to earn a living while practising her chosen profession. In May 1939, prior to her applying for the commission, Nora was planning a solo exhibition. As the months progressed and tensions relating to war rose, Nora was anxious, she was nervous about producing enough work for her self-imposed deadline, and as world news worsened, the idea of an exhibition became less feasible. And in August, she wrote to her parents. Now it seems that only a miracle can save the world from another 1914. I find it all too disturbing. Somehow, even over here, with all this glorious sunshine, one can't even remain impervious to the shifting of world powers and the terrific anxiety and strain that has gripped England and Europe. One thinks war an impossibility, and yet everyone over here is depressed. Brackenridge came down on Monday looking very gloomy and despondent. It has just dawned on him that artists are in for some lean years and that prospects are desperate. Just weeks later, on 11th September, Nora writes that she, was that she has postponed her show until November, assuming events allowed. War had been declared a week before, and her thoughts immediately went to her young brother, Michael. The relief she expressed to her parents when she heard that men would not be sent from Australia would be short-lived. One can only hope, she said, and pray that this terrible madness will stop before we are too far in to withdraw. Every morning I awake to realise it afresh. The powerful Australian wool broker, James MacDonald, patron and Heisen friend, James McGregor, I beg your pardon, was also concerned for the welfare of the country's artists, telling Nora, it is indeed a poor outlook. As Nora approached 30 years old, entering a new decade, News came from home, reaching her including photographs of new babies and she referred to being an aunt four times over. These images of happy and secure children and the rising world tensions and her own professional insecurities gave rise to a deep reflection. And she writes again to her parents. In the life of an artist, there is no contentment and no security, a game of chance and gamble and a game with odds well against me. Now more than ever, the outlook for artists is pretty hopeless. It becomes daily more difficult to concentrate on any work and quite impossible to shut out that daily millions are being slaughtered and millions suffering the loss of all they possess. Today is a glorious autumn day with the harbour sparkling in the sun. No wonder we out here find it difficult to realise the horror in Europe. World War II saw the establishment of the first women's services, and this was the opening that Nora pursued. Hans Heysen's friend Louis McCubbin, son of the artist Frederick McCubbin, was director of the then National Gallery of South Australia, a board member of the War Memorial and a member of its art committee. And McCubbin wrote to the appointments committee on Nora's behalf. And he said, Nora Heysen is one of the most accomplished women artists and represented in most Australian galleries. She could be used in a variety of ways, painting portraits and covering the activities of the women's services. Her appointment was approved, along with Russell Drysdale and Arnold Shaw, to cover the industrial war effort and the women's services organisations. The latter apparently a hastily defined job description added to accommodate Nora's gender and very particular role in the armed forces. While I was researching this book, and now when I'm out speaking, people ask me, why, why do we need war artists? We have high-tech digital cameras, videos, drones, computers, smartphones, all capable of creating strong pu and, uh, and publishable images. And my answer is that the artist injects the emotion, the humanity, the human response in interpreting a moment that a camera cannot. An artistic photographer can generate powerful and emotive images. That is not denied. But there is something unique about the application of pencil, ink or crayon or paint on paper or canvas. It is the light and shade that sits in the human response to a lived experience that can produce a potent image that transcends the bare facts. 
It is the emotional response from an artist on the ground that delivers the viewer into the moment through that artist's eyes and heart. And this is what Nora delivered during her commission and, and the collection that now sits in the War Memorial. Her 62 paintings, 102 drawings and her sketchbooks record the work of the Australian Women's Army Service in Australia and the Women's Services Active in the Pacific where she was posted to casualty clearance stations. But how did she come to be the first woman to be commissioned as a war artist? It was a bold move and it did not come without its difficulties. The life of a woman wanting to be a career artist in the 1930s was fraught to say the least. And Nora was not shy in claiming her territory. In her 20s, stating she wanted to be known as an artist, not a female artist, simply an artist to be judged purely on the merit of her work. Perhaps naive and embedded in wishful thinking, Nora forged ahead, but she faced many obstacles in the art world before she received her commission in 1943. Despite spectacular early successes, her War Artist Commission, exhibitions, portrait commissions and the winning of prestigious prizes, Nora Heysen fell from view and languished in relative obscurity for almost 40 years after the war was over. She was considered out of date as the modernist artists and critics relegated many realist painters to the quarters of the old fashioned. But in 1989, she was brought back into view by curator and publisher Lou Klepak. She enjoyed a resurgence of interest in her work and is now finally elevated to the position that she deserves in Australian art history. And most recently in the current joint retrospective exhibition showing at the NGV in Melbourne, Hans and Nora Hyson, Two Generations of Australian Art. My book, Nora Hyson, A Portrait, is the first biography of Nora. And I've been grateful for the Hyson family's support over the last four years as I've researched this book. This is my contribution to the ongoing conversation about women in art and the restitution to their rightful place, a conversation that started with the new wave of feminism in the 1970s and which has progressed particularly in the last 20 years in a most meaningful way across the art institutions in this country. The recent NGA initiative, Know My Name, and the launching of the Sheila Foundation in Western Australia last month, a testimony to the commitment to rewrite women back into art history. There are distinct chapters in Nora's life, from her childhood at the family home in the Cedars in the Adelaide Hills to her final days in Sydney. And throughout all these stages, there was one prevailing element. Nora lived her life propelled by an all-consuming drive to draw or paint. And of this compulsion, she said, this is my earliest memory. It will be my last memory, I think, that I must put something on paper. Of the eight Heysen children, it was Nora who showed early signs of a natural artistic talent and her father was quick to foster it. The teenage Nora working alongside her father in his studio was seen by her mother as a distraction for Hans and Sally arranged for Nora to have her own space to work. Nora recounts that visitors to her father's studio would marvel at one of Hans's latest works, not realising they were loudly praising the teenage protégé and not the master. She said, I don't think father felt so much about it, but mother did. She arranged for me to work outside of father's studio. Aged in her 80s, Nora told art historian and curator Mary Eagle, I can show you a painting so like his style, all I'd have to do is sign Hans Heysen and he'd be the artist. Curator Jane Hilton is unequivocal about Nora's skill as a young girl. You see her drawings next to her father's and they are interchangeable. It's extraordinary. And Nora's plans for her paintings were sometimes at risk from a father who had helped train her eye for composition. On one occasion, having meticulously set up a still life of onions to work on in her spare time, she returned to it to see work, uh, uh, she, sorry, returned to it after work at school to, to start painting and she was irritated to see that her father had set up his easel and had already painted it. This is Nora's version. They're currently both side by side at the NGV and it's very interesting to be able to make the comparison of the two works. I've heard that there's been a straw poll taken and most people prefer Nora's. 
Hans Heysen was also prone to touches of insensitivity in his enthusiasm to guide his daughter. But Nora was generous in her memory of him despite finding charcoal corrections covering a freshly finished work. He genuinely tried not to influence me so I could try to develop my own style. Sometimes he couldn't resist, of course, and I remember one day I left a painting of a basket of eggs in the studio, which I thought was pretty good, but when I came back, I found Father had drawn squares all over it, showing where my draftsmanship was wrong. I was furious. Of course, he was right, but it took me a long time to see it. There would be many occasions when the men who held influence over Nora's artistic situation would find themselves on the re receiving end of her quiet determination. And this would later be the case for Lieutenant Colonel John Trelaw, who would oversee Nora's War Artist Commission. When she was 22, Nora's highly successful 1933 solo exhibition raised £1,000 to cover three years of art in London. It was in the years just before departing that Nora produced her seminal self-portraits, the portraits Nora would go on to produce of the women in charge of the women's services were extraordinary in their execution and the formal early training that Nora undertook at the North Adelaide School of Fine Arts and later her three years studying in London provided the artistic foundation for these official portraits. It was also this training that prepared her for entering the prestigious Archibald Prize, the richest art prize in the country and one that could secure an artist's reputation and career for years to come. Despite crippling criticism Nora received from the men who taught in the London school she attended, she displayed her characteristic strength and pushed on with her plan to be an artist. While she respected the men that her father had sent her to for the guidance, she was perplexed at the mixed signals she was receiving. In her own words, Nora says that the great watercolourist and academician C.J. Holmes devastated her confidence when he laughed at her idea to paint figures in the landscape in the Renaissance style. Already represented in every major gallery in Australia after sellout shows before she went to London, the assessment that her work was mannered and showed no emotion puzzled her. Returning from London in 1938 with a new style of painting that separated her from her father's more conservative approach, Nora knew it was time to strike out on her own. And there was not enough room at the Cedars for two artists. In the years that followed her move to Sydney, Nora demonstrated her independence, both in her approach to her art and in how she would live her life. The central events that illustrate that independence were firstly her choice of subject that would win her the most prestigious art prize in the country in 1938. A decision she made that would see her commissioned as Australia's first woman official war artist in 1943 and finding love with a married man. The third event remained pivotal to the choices she made for her life and the ramifications of this love would prove to be profound. Her Archibald win was announced in January 1939, just days after her 28th birthday. It was a contentious win with the same artist who later attacked Dobell for his 1940, 1943 Archibald win for whether it was caricature or portraiture of Joshua Smith attacked Nora, one going so far as to tell her to return the money. The other detractor, fellow entrant Max Meldrum, who would go on to win the following year, was very vocal in his opinion and ended up in the press the next day. And he was quoted, if I were a woman, I would certainly prefer raising a healthy family to a career in art. Men and women are differently constituted. Women are more closely attached to the physical things of life. They are not to blame. They cannot help it. And to expect them to do some things equally as well as men is sheer lunacy. <laughs> Good luck with that today. The, the Australian Women's Weekly managed to reduce her win to a cookery column with the headline, Girl Painter Who Won Art Prize Is Also Good Cook. And we were privileged to read her duck with olive sauce recipe with a photograph of her in the kitchen. Once again, Nora put her head down and got on with the commissions that resulted from her win, responding to her detractors with, art's art to me, no matter who does it, men, women or what. The Archibald 
did mean the win bought more than uh, portrait commissions. It was the prize that established Nora. She was officially accepted as a portraitist and would be taken seriously by the art community power brokers. Her father's friends, Sidney Ewer Smith, Lionel Lindsay, Louis McCubbin and James McGregor, would all prove instrumental in guiding her through the application process for a War Artist Commission, while her reputation as an Archibald winner cemented her credentials. Nora received her commission in February 1943. At first she was uncomfortable in army uniform and came to loathe khaki, declaring that it was a foul colour to paint and it doesn't suit women. A little bit awkward when you consider the uniforms. She wrote to her parents as she tackled the first of the work she was required to produce, a portrait of Lieutenant Colonel Sybil Irving, controller of the Australian Women's Army Service, saying that she was immersed in the khaki colour scheme, with the only relief coming from the red stripes on Irving's lapels and ribbons on her chest. Historian Catherine Speck says that Nora wrestled with the colour scheme and eventually produced portraits that were quite stunning, saying the portraits firmly placed these women leaders in our military culture as significant historical figures as they should be. Nora's portrait of Matron Annie Sage highlights Nora's skill in representing the individual qualities of each of these uniformed women. The matron's red cape provided a great relief to Nora from the khaki that dominated her palette. She wrote to her parents, I am working on Matron Sage and I'm painting her in a white cap and red cape. She has a fine head and the whole thing is like a Flemish old master. Van Eyck would have loved her. Catherine Speck observed that Heysen captures the matron like a Madonna, encapsulating a blend of compassion and experience in the red cape itself. But Nora was itching to see some action and wanted to travel overseas. It, had been suggest it has been suggested that Matron Sage took a liking to Nora and during their portrait sessions she was keen for her nurses work in New Guinea to be represented by Nora for the War Memorial. As an AWAS commissioned officer, Nora was restricted to service at home, but after Sage's request to Colonel Trelaw, it was arranged that Nora would be placed on the special army list that would allow her to travel. When Nora left, for New Guinea, she was the only woman in Australia to fly, and an, the only woman and the only Australian on the American Lockheed out of Brisbane for Port Moresby at dawn on the 8th of April 1944. She wrote home saying that she enjoyed her first experience of air travel, describing it as exhilarating and beautiful. And she writes, flying these days seems as casual as catching a taxi. It amazed me taking off with so little fuss on such a long trip. Passengers and luggage were piled in haphazardly with rubber tyres and jeeps and soldiers all on top of each other. And a young fellow with rolled up shirt sleeves took his place at the engines and off we went with a cheery call to hang on as everything tipped down to the tail end. <laughs> it appears Nora was not particularly welcome addition at the base at Finschaffen when she arrived. The nurses who served there had earned their rank and place in the armed forces through service in North Africa and the Middle East. And they were often outranked by Nora, who had arrived direct from the comfort of the Menzies Hotel in Melbourne with automatic captain's pips and the pay to go with them. She was ostracised within the compound. I'm living with the sisters and have been allotted a tent to myself. One sleeps on a straw mattress and under a net and everything creeps and crawls and smells of mildew. My tent looks out onto the Owen Stanleys and just outside are growing pawpaws and bananas. Five months at the Menzies was not the best training for this life. She recounts on one occasion she woke up to find a rat eating her watch band off her wrist. She adds in a following letter, there are 14 women here. They do not accept me as one of themselves and I live isolated in my little tent apart from their quarters and they have built-in sheds with electric light wardrobes and soft mattresses. After a month of being in the nurse's company, Nora suggests that they're getting more or less used to me now. The working conditions were difficult for Nora apart from any personal issues but she did not allow either to affect her work ethic. Within a week of arriving, she had a number of works underway, writing home, there is subject matter plenty, but how to tackle it? I feel like a raw beginner and quite a loss. 
When I go out painting for the day, they pack me up white bait and asparagus and tinned orange juice, and I sit and lunch on a blasted coconut stump or on the edge of a bomb crater, and I find myself wondering, how many died on just this spot only five short months ago? Incredible to try and picture it. And she also wrote home about her first trip out on a jeep up to the Sattelberg mission. It had been bombed out by the Japanese not that long before. And they were up there with a photographer and she was sitting in a foxhole. She'd found a log to sit on and found a piece of board that she could do a nice picture of on. And uh, after a little while, she'd been painting and a strange smell was emanating from underneath her and the log that she was on was actually a dead Japanese soldier. Her descriptions of working conditions include the effects of the constant wet and humidity. Everywhere, mud ankle deep and the smell of mildew and rotting. My paintings mildew overnight. They'll be old masters before I get them back. She spent time in the operating theatre making preliminary sketches for paintings and her respect for the surgeon is clear. Every time a patient comes in for an operation, the surgeon rings me up and I go out and get my impressions in the theatre. Yesterday, a native with a badly crushed foot. The surgeon did a delicate skin graft over the wound and when he'd sewn the tendons and joined the splintered bones. The skin graft is wonderful and horrifying to watch. It is only by going out from time to time and coming at it again that I can watch and draw these things. And I wish someone else had been detailed off for this job. There's no doubt it's interesting but I can't get the things I see out of my mind, as her father had feared. This composition progresses slowly. The surgeon is an artist at his job and one watches him sew up a vein with the delicate touch of a woman. Nora would also face matters of the heart, a peril that her father had perhaps not anticipated. This was to be a fateful journey in Nora's personal life. In Finschaffen, she met tropical medicine specialist Dr. Robert Black, a member of a team researching prevention and improved treatments of malaria, the cause of devastating casualties in tropical warfare in the Pacific. It was said that at one point we were losing more troops to malaria than we were to the enemy and something had to be done. Within weeks of Nora landing in Finschaffen, she had fallen deeply for Black. And throughout the war, the two maintained their romance by writing often twice daily while constantly trying to arrange to see each other as often as possible. Black returned to Cairns to continue his work at the Land Headquarters Medical Research Unit. The letters held at the NLA and in Nora's personal archive at the Cedars a testament to a passionate love. But there was a deep impediment to the relationship. Black was married and the father of a young son. For a conservative family, the affair would later prove hard to accept, but Nora would not be swayed. Letters between the two track an intense love and deep commitment to find a way to be together. Nora's sensuous works of black done in private moments together after evidence of a powerful offer evidence of a powerful relationship that would have far-reaching consequences and that years later would end in heartbreak for Nora. Amidst all this unfamiliar emotional turmoil Nora was experiencing, because Robert Black was her first love and her only love, she was receiving signals from Trelaw back in Australia that her work that she had sent down had not been well received. The relationship between Nora and her commanding officer was fraught for the duration and it's discussed in detail in my book and it, I think that Trelaw was doing a incredible job in managing what he had to manage and you'll see that as we've discussed there are two sides to this. The problem was Nora was an oil painting. I beg your pardon, she might have liked to have been an oil painting but she was an oil painter and the tropics did not allow for this method in the best of conditions. Her modus operandi was to create detailed sketches and work the paintings up into full canvases once back in a studio. For Trelaw, the works he did see were not the heroic and serious images he expected. He took particular exception to a watercolour of the nurses having an afternoon tea party and to another of a social dance, and I believe there was also one of a nurse in a bath. 
these misunderstandings would, have, would eventually be sorted out and a mutual respect would eventuate with the help of McCubbin's intervention. After almost having her commission prematurely terminated, Nora went on to deliver more than Trelaw could have hoped for. Trelaw had given Nora the benefit of the doubt and he was not disappointed. In July 1944, Nora was scheduled to leave for Leh and Alakshafen in order to travel to Madang to record the establishment of a new casualty clearing station. Robert Black was now back in Australia and working on his research. Their letters are a catalogue of desire and wishful thinking while imagining a future when they might be reunited. Before Nora left Finschafen, she created a ruction when she refused the first movement order to lay. She'd been working on a substantial oil painting of tropical flowers. This was well outside the parameters of her brief. Yet she produced the stunning work, The Flower Ship, and wrote to her parents that she feared a court-martial after refusing the order to move south to Ley. Her lack of army awareness is stunning. The fact that she hoped that her gender might help her is also intriguing. And she writes to her parents, had just begun on a large bunch of tropical flowers and was in the midst of it when a movement order came through to return to Ley immediately and my plane seat was already booked. I dug my heels in. Last night I was told I had to move this morning, but I told them it was impossible as I hadn't finished my flowers and now I'm waiting repercussions, probably a court-martial or I'll be shot at dawn or else. Being a woman, they may allow for whims. This has gone on for three days and through them I have painted from dawn to dusk, interrupted by the telephone. The flowers are lovely here. Hibiscus, frangipani, lilies, cannas and coral flowers. Here I am at home and have enjoyed the escape from military subjects. She continued in her letter that she was called before the commanding officer and was relieved when he told her she had been granted a week's grace. The painting, which changed hands at auction in 2013 for $48,800, is described by Jane Hilton. The composition records a moment of joy in an otherwise difficult time, the two blooms echoing the two roses that sit similarly positioned in Hyson's The Lovebirds. Is it possible that the flower ship oil was, she was finishing off at the end of June was a representation of Nora and Black together in the turmoil of war and love. She did not hand it over to the war memorial as she was required to do with all work done while an official war artist. I painted the flower piece and it was one the war museum didn't get. Eugene Schlusser, the documentary filmmaker comments, Sick of war and the wounded, full of love for Robert, she was inspired to paint the flower ship. During the period in Finchaf and before Nora moved out, it is clear that the relationship with Robert Black had become very serious very quickly. In fact, just over three months, the pair had declared their love for one another. When the war was over, Robert Black returned to his wife and son in Sydney and Nora continued on into 1946 at the Melbourne studios, completing the old paintings that would be a lasting memorial to her subjects. Black was appointed to the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine in England and left the country with his family. But Nora was determined, and a year later, after the two had continued to write declarations of love to each other, Nora made her way to Liverpool to get her man. It was a bold move to make in 1947, and while the two did make a life together back in Australia, there was no happy ending. Towards the end of Nora's commission, when peace was in the air, Nora was detailed to cover the work of one of the medical air evacuation units. This episode encapsulates the great value of war artists on a very personal level, while at the same time recognising service to country. And I read this section from my book. Nora flew up and down the coastline of northern Queensland as she accompanied the nurses knowing, known as the Flying Angels who flew in and out of the Pacific combat zones, delivering supplies and evacuating the wounded to base hospitals in Australia. Nora participated in medical evacuations from Leigh and Moratai back to Townsville. 
She was focused about the kind of material she was after and eventually wrote home late in June that she was on the move from an undisclosed position in the Pacific, later revealed as Moritai. I'll be away three or four days and then will return here, I hope, with my subject matter. It will be difficult working on the plane full of stretcher cases, cases over the eight-hour flight and I don't know how it will go. The air is electric with rumours and every hour brings the peace nearer in talk. It will be bedlam here if news comes through. Everyone is hanging over the wireless waiting. The guns are ready to go off in the blast of victory. The island will tremble. Peace might have been in the air, but there was tragedy still to come. Nora was sharing quarters with some of the sisters and a memoir held at the, at the War Memorial written by one of these nurses, Flying Sister Beryl Chandler, records the interaction her unit had with Nora and the death of one of her fellow nurses, Flying Sister Marie Craig. Nora drew Craig three days before peace was declared in the Pacific. And Beryl Chandler writes, Nora had approached me many times to sit for her and for one reason or another, I did not want to. One day there was only Marie, Nora and myself in the officer's mess when once again Nora asked me to allow her to paint me. Again, I wasn't keen and dithered, whereupon Marie said to Nora, Look, Nora, you might as well paint me. I'll pose for you. This job is going to kill me anyway. And at least people will know what Marie Craig looked like. I was aghast at this statement, said Bill Chandler, because she seemed to mean it. I remember saying to her, Marie... It is a volunteer job and no one would mind if you transferred to ground duties. But she was adamant. She was going to fly on and she was just as sure she was not going to make it home to Australia. No, Chan, she said. The writing is on the wall. I'm just not going to come through. She loved the work. It gave her immense satisfaction, but she had this strong premonition that she would be killed. Craig sat for Nora one month before she was lost, along with Captain Crew. Sorry. And all on board. Sorry. When her plane disappeared, it was found 25 years later on the side of a mountain 14,000 feet above sea level in the Karstens Ranges in Indonesian Papua. In conversation with Michael Cathcart in 2001 for ABC Radio, Nora recalled the event. I was detailed off for bringing the wounded down from New Guinea and there was always a nursing sister in attendance and I drew her. On two accounts they came down and were killed and I thought, well, those portraits that I had done of them should go to their families and I sent them to their mothers. I don't know if for better or for worse. I don't know, but I did that. The War Museum could have objected to that, couldn't they? And Michael Cathcart said, I think in theory, but not morally. Oh no, said Nora. It was very sad because they really didn't get the recognition. But that lack of recognition for those nurses referred to by Nora has shifted over the years with their work celebrated and remembered. Well after peace was declared, operations to locate and repatriate POWs and the wounded continued. And Sister Verdun Shea's plane crashed on one of these missions. She was 29 when she died on the 15th of November 1945. And the two women are immortalised in Nora's work. Nora's War Artist Commission shows some of her strongest portrait work and despite the criticisms from C.J. Ho Holmes, she did produce figures in the landscape. And I discuss this in the book. And one of the final works that Nora completed is perhaps one of her best known war art works, Transport Driver Aircraft Woman Florence Miles. When the work was painted, towards the end of 1945, Nora was seven years into living as an independent woman well away from her family and her father's direct influence. In this work, the shackles of the domestic sphere and the traditional role of soldier have been upended. Nora was also in uniform. The academicians that had thwarted her had passed on. London had been bombed 
and the threat of a Japanese invasion of Australia had presented as a real possibility, and the women of Australia were on board, pivotal to a successful Allied effort. In ignoring her father's concerns for her well-being by enlisting and taking independent control of her life, Nora had succeeded as the nation's first woman war artist. The National Gallery's assessment that might suggest a description of the artist herself, not just in her supporting her country, but in progressing her personal beliefs and goals to live her life as an artist. And their descriptor of this work reads, In this portrait, Heysen combines the heroic with the everyday stoicism of women who just get on with the job. Getting on with the job in 1945 meant that women assumed the roles and responsibilities which before the Second World War had been the preserve of men. Florence Miles inspires confidence. She is feminine and strong. Her committed gaze through the windscreen, together with the RAAF flag visible through her window, play like a confident anthem on the road to the Allies' victory. Nora's own character mirrors the attributes the NGA applies to the work. This strength of character, her committed gaze and determination is a testament to the upbringing that she received. She learned by example that through thorough application to a task, a result could be achieved. That result could be measured in terms of how the job had been approached and this appeared to involve a profound sincerity. In the course of writing this biography, I continued to ask myself why this extraordinary artist was not better known, and I came to the conclusion that Nora Heysen was a woman interrupted. She was interrupted by winning the most prestigious art prize in the country and the expectations that were associated with a win of that kind. By her country's declaration of war that redirected her out of the public eye, by love and the associated heartache of falling for a married man in the 1940s. She submitted to the expectations placed on a woman as a homemaker in the 1950s and was devastated by the abandonment by a husband she had waited 10 years to marry for a younger woman in a workplace romance. The final assault was her grief over the death of her unofficially adopted son, Stephen, from an AIDS-related disease. But through all of this, Nora was sustained by her art and hers was a satisfying life expressed through her creativity and her love for nature. She was courageous, she was happy, as long as she could paint. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I hope everyone enjoyed that as much as I did. Um, we've got some time for some questions, if anyone has any that they'd like to ask. Yes, down the front here, Karen. Um, do you know if Nora, uh, could you tell us if Nora Heysen was friendly with any other war artists? Well, some of the artists that she knew were appointed um, and she met them when she was painting in Melbourne, uh, the studios there. Um, and uh, yes, uh, uh, <laughs> yes, the answer is yes. I'll, to give you a list off the top of my head of her associates, I can't tell you that. But um, She did cross paths with a couple of them again yes. when she was there. So I think it was Roy... Roy Hodgkinson yes. was in New Guinea at the same time as Nora was and they actually, he actually took Nora out on a kind of a bit of an excursion at one point. So she did cross paths with several of her male counterparts at the same time. And there were also a number of them at any one time working out of the hotel in Melbourne, the yes. Menzies Hotel. Mm. Um, so she got to um, look at Ivor Heal's work. Um, I think she very much admired his work. That's what I was going to say, because just looking around the gallery, his work is the only work that to me has the em emotional element in his pictures that is so prevalent in her work. So I wondered if they had worked together. I don't know if they've worked together. I think because where Nora was uh, posted, the works that she was uh, supposed to cover, and in fact it was a, a very broad brief that she had been given and at one point she felt quite overwhelmed with the amount of material, the amount of services that she was 
that she had interpreted that she was supposed to be covering. I think that, that perhaps there was a... The communication was difficult. Um, at one stage, she felt that there was a lot she was supposed to be doing and that she was doing her best. But um, she was working to cover the nurses in, a, in sometimes men were not allowed to be in those spaces. That's the other thing. That was why it was a good thing to have Nora as a war artist because she could actually go into those places that there weren't, the men were actually not allowed. The, the nurses were often behind barbed wire and, yeah. Um, the, uh, the painting in the uh, Second World War gallery of Ango, the police boy, um, uh, got me interested in Nora Heisen for the first time. And I was just wondering, did she uh, have a, uh, a, 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 a bent or an interest in painting uh, Papua New Guinean uh, indigenous people, or was there another side to that? Well, I think the side was that she found them very beautiful and, and magnificent, uh, f the beautiful features. She does write about how she would just... She was enjoying so much drawing them, though. The, yes, she did have. They did appeal to her very much as subject matter. She found them to be noble and kind and very helpful. And these were actually, she was a very kind and loyal person. I think there was. A, she understood their motives. She admired them. She wanted to give them recognition. And Catherine Speck actually refers in her book. Um, Painting Ghosts, she's written about women war artists and their roles, that how Nora was right on that nexus between understanding the different cultures. We were seeing it not from an imperial perspective, but she was alert to their contribution, yes, and wanted to honour them, I think. Mm. Well, thank you very much again, everyone, for coming along. And please um, join me in thanking um, Anne Louise for her wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you so much for coming. Oh, yeah. Sorry? Sorry, I nearly forgot. Um, for those of you who haven't had the chance to read the book, the book is for sale at the moment in the Moore Memorial Shop. So please... Go up and have a look if you want to buy a copy. It's a very good read. Thank you.